Linda. It's <laughs> good. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm going to take you on an adventure this morning. The story I'm about to tell you is true. Names have not been changed. It's actually in the introduction of my book. So if you want to read it in the entirety, it will be available after the service. That's a shameless plug. <laughs> you are going to the Canadian Rockies with me. Are you ready? My husband, Charlie, and I were there on a bicycle trip. Yes, bicycle trip in the mountains. As a side trip, we, well, mostly Charlie, decided we were going on a whitewater rafting adventure. Yeah, that look is exactly how I felt, Susan. The idea of whitewater rafting turns up terror in my heart. We rode in an old school bus to the parking lot, and on the way there, the guide casually mentioned, usually the, the water level is a three. But because of all the spring rains, it's up to a level four. More terror in my heart. But we got to the parking lot, lots of other people were there milling around. There were life jackets, wetsuits, and helmets, that's a clue that we needed to wear and get ready for this whitewater rafting adventure. Our guide gathered us all around him and he gave us instructions. Now you know if you have ever been whitewater rafting, what's the first most important instruction? Always listen to your guide for instructions. Actually, his, he was so enthusiastic, and his confidence was contagious, so I started to feel just a little bit exhilarated. So we were a parade, you gotta picture this, five yellow rafts, inflatable rafts, eight of us in each one, and a guide in the rear of each one. And ours was the second one to put in the river. Our first two minutes were smooth, then we came around a bend in the river, and within seconds, a wall of water appeared. I am not kidding. It was a wall of water two stories high, and the next thing I knew, I was under the water, scrambling and gasping to get to the surface. When I came up, the raft, our raft was within my sight, Charlie and another gal were the only two people still in it. And I am always glad to see my husband, but never more than right then. And he had a look of relief on his face, so I think he was pretty glad to see me too. So he pulled out, Charlie pulled out his paddle to me and I grabbed hold and he pulled me back in the boat. And then our guide appeared. He had been thrown overboard too. <laughs> Big help, right? <laughs> so he got us into shallow water and, and got us all back together again and got us in the boat and we continued on. Now, rough waters, it was a rough water day for sure. So when I was thinking about this, rough waters, we have all been in rough waters, right? Storms. And maybe that wall of water was so high, it felt like a tsunami. Yes, you're nodding. And I'm looking at you, and I know. I know. <clears throat> the biggest tsunami of my life began about two years ago right now. Charlie and I both got COVID, and I recovered. He did not. He was six weeks in the hospital, and he died on December 30th, two days after our 36th anniversary. I loved my life with Charlie. <laughs> he was larger than life. 
He was the life of the party, really, and he was the love of my life. He was a teacher and a coach, and he had a gift for bringing out the best in people. He made coffee every day for me, and mornings were our talk time. Our grandson, Zach, said to me, Jan, I want a girl who looks at me the way Grandpa looks at you. Charlie's death was a tsunami that shook my world. Shook my world. Changed everything about the landscape of my life. Everything. So the question is, what do we do when a tsunami hits? How do we keep from drowning? After Charlie died, I cried for six months. I'm not a crier. I am all about joy. But the life was gone out of me, too. In that grief, in being so homesick for him, all I knew was that I wanted to honor Charlie and I wanted to glorify God. I had no idea what that looked like. But God threw me a lifeline. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, you will not drown. I will be with you. I felt like I was drowning. I needed that promise, and I hung on to it with all my heart. You will not drown. I will be with you. Clung to that promise. And God threw me many lifelines in my people, my people, my friends who, <laughs> my dear, brave soul friends who would be around me when I was no fun at all. They invited me into their homes, to meals, to concerts. They talked about Charlie. What a gift that was. And they helped me in so many ways. I had one friend who regularly said, Jan, give me your list. And I did, and he went to work on it repeatedly. So I was in that receiving mode. I just received all the love and all the help. And I have to tell you, I like much better being on the other end of that. It wasn't the season. I had to sell our house, find a smaller place to live. Many friends helped me find the place, helped me pack, helped me move. Just, just my friends were lifelines. They were Jesus with skin on. And the truth is, we have Jesus. Jesus himself is our lifeline. He will never be thrown out of the boat. He promises to be with us always. He will never leave us or forsake us. And I read in one source that there are over 3,000 scripture verses that, that talk about God's promise of his presence. He is always with us, our ever-present help in trouble. And nothing surprises him. In John 16, 33, he said that we have a warning. In the world, you will have troubles, distress, suffering. He knows that. We will. It's a fallen world. And he gives us instructions. Be courageous, be undaunted, be filled with joy. And I was thinking, how? how? How do you do that in a tsunami? How do you stay afloat and keep from drowning? And how do we be filled with joy? Remember the, the first most important instruction in a whitewater rafting adventure? Always listen to your guide. So let's pause a minute and do that. Let's just pause and get in God's presence where there is fullness of joy. And just, and I will say this, if you want to close your eyes, you can. But just breathe, because that was kind of the first thing all year long that I just tried to keep breathing. Just breathe. And breathe in his love, 
his peace, his joy, strength, refreshment, ease, confidence. Everything we need is in God's presence. That fullness of joy, which I've done some reading on this, and it's a great topic if you want to Google it, about fullness of joy. It is actually the communion with him. That vertical communion is fullness of joy. <clears throat> I have to tell you my new favorite quote. Joy is the oxygen for doing hard things. That's a good one to take with you. Joy is the oxygen for doing hard things. So let's talk about that for a minute. What do you do for your joy? Seriously, somebody tell us. Yoga. Hiking. Oh, yes, music, singing, playing the piano. Talking with your friends, playing games, bananagrams. I met my friend who lives in Minnesota every week faithfully for the last two years she has shown up, and we play bananagrams on Zoom. So whatever brings you joy, whatever fills you up, think about that. And I'm going to ask you, this is an assignment should you choose to accept it, something that you do this week for your joy. Will you do that? Yeah. And you can tell me if you want to. I would love to hear that follow-up. So joy is a lifeline. And doesn't it make you feel refreshed and lighter just talking about it? Yeah. <clears throat> I have a cousin, Kay, who's actually just lost her husband. She has lost two adult children. And she is faithful and upbeat and positive. And I said to her one day, how do you do that? And she said, I compartmentalize. She puts the suffering over here, and she still finds ways to do things that bring her joy. Compartmentalize. And we'll continue talking about joy. In coaching, through my coaching with people, I have come to a, a conclusion that true joy is knowing who we are and becoming who we are created to be. Let's say that again. True joy is knowing who we are and becoming who we are created to be. So the, the joy of knowing who we are, we know who we are, right? God's children. We have a Heavenly Father who loves us so much, we can't even get our heads around it. And he has loved us before we were born, and he will love us through this life and into eternity, forever and ever. That's who we are, God's beloved children. He lavishes love on us. And he gives us hope and a future. That's the kind of father we have. And he lives in us. And he's with us always. So we know who we are. So the becoming part, and we know that God's purpose for us is that we become more like Jesus. So the becoming part implies growing. You've heard the word, the term, post-traumatic stress. Have you ever heard the term post-traumatic growth? I heard it first from another lifeline that was thrown to me. Krista St. Germain is a coach online for widows. And her husband had died when she was 40 years old and she had two small children. So in her research and learning and wanting to get through that tsunami, she has a message that caught me. She said, I coach widows to love life again. And really, isn't that what we want after a trauma, after a tsunami? We just want life to be good again. Yeah. So post-traumatic growth, and I'm still trying to get my head around this. The mean, what it means is that 
We become better because of our pain and our suffering, not in spite of it, but because of it. God uses that pain, that suffering, and makes beauty from ashes. So that's the growth part, and we need his help to do that because it's way too big for us on our own. So to keep from sinking in those tsunamis, we get into his presence, we get filled with his fullness of joy, and we know those plans of, that he has for growing us. So think about people that you know who are examples of post-traumatic growth. And I will, I'll share one. My friend Lindy, since fifth grade, the last two years ago she was diagnosed with scleroderma, which is a scarring of the lungs. And Lindy was always active and, and it's really limited her and what she can do. She's had a strong faith for as long as I've known her, but I have watched her press into Jesus more than ever before. And she's a beautiful artist, and she's taken up painting again. So she is a beautiful example of post-traumatic growth. She just keeps relying on God to help her and trusting him with what he has for her. And we need those people. We need those examples of inspiration. And I, I'm looking out here and seeing saints, you saints. And it's not just that you are resilient or you persevere. It's beyond that. Post-traumatic growth implies thriving. So I thank you for your examples of, your examples of doing that. When Judy asked me to do this message for you, I knew that I wanted to talk about tsunamis. I wanted to acknowledge yours, because I know some of your tsunamis. I wanted to remind you, because you already know this, the best protection against drowning in a tsunami is getting into God's presence. And I wanted to encourage you to do things for your joy. But a couple nights ago, I had a conversation with my stepdaughter, Jennifer, who has also been a lifeline. And she said, Jan, you have to, you have to tell them how you really were. She reminded me that after her dad died, I was paralyzed, literally paralyzed with grief. So I thought joy was part of my identity and there was not a speck of joy in me. Getting out of bed some days was the most I could do. She also reminded me that I kept saying, I just need to lean into Jesus. And she said, Jan, you never gave up. It's been two years since my tsunami hit. I feel like I'm starting to get my land legs back a little bit. I'm learning to live with the grief, and I'm being really intentional about my joy, and thank you for those of you who hold that up for me all these two years. So after talking with Jennifer, I thought, you know, there's another important message that I need to tell you. And that is sometimes the best we can do is hold on. Just hold on to God and hold on to hope. And Lord, I'm just going to ask you to hear our prayer. Help us to hold on to you and hold on to the hope that we have in you. Bless these sweet people. Amen.